Thank you, Dr. Rubin. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Um, <clears throat> as Dr. Rubin pointed out, I'm going to be going over and providing a fairly high-level overview on the approval pathways for biosimilar products in the U.S. The pathway for biosimilar product approval is a fairly recent one. Um, it occurred in 2010. Prior to this, there was no mechanism by which follow-on biologics could be approved by FDA and brought to the U.S. market. Um, in contrast, since 1984, small molecule drugs have been able to have generic competition under the Hatch-Waxman mechanism. So up until 2010, there was no mechanism by which innovator biological drugs could face so-called generic competition. This changed in 2010 as part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was enacted into law. Um, and as part of that, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act was passed. And this act put new provisions into place in the Public Health Service Act that created an abbreviated path pathway under which FDA could license biosimilar products. And after much controversy and, and negotiations in Congress, Congress also passed legislation to authorize the approval of interchangeable biologics, which are a subset of biosimilars, and I'll go into those in a little detail later. Currently, there are two separate frameworks for FDA approval of drug products, one being the framework of a new drug application, which is how innovator small molecule drugs are approved by FDA. And this pathway includes small molecule drugs, peptides, as well as certain types of proteins like human growth hormone and insulin. Under this pathway, generic drugs can also be approved using an abbreviated new drug application. In contrast, for the rest of the drug products, including most biologicals, these are approved by way of a biologics license application, or a BLA. A full BLA for innovator biological products is essentially a standalone application that contains data from clinical studies demonstrating that the innovator biological is safe, pure, and effective for its conditions of use. The goal of a biosimilar development program, however, is a little bit different, and it, biosimilar applications do not strive to independently establish safety and efficacy for the proposed biosimilar. Instead, what biosimilar applications are seeking to do is to demonstrate that they are biosimilar to a reference innovator biological product by demonstrating that they're highly similar in spite of some minor clinical differences in terms of um, inactive components, as well as they, there are no clinically meaningful differences between the reference product and the biosimilar. Biosimilar applications are also required to contain evidence demonstrating that the biosimilar product operates by the same mechanism of action as the reference product to the extent that it's known, that the proposed conditions of use, including indications for the biosimilar product, have previously been approved for the reference product, and that the biosimilar applicate, that the biosimilar product has the same route of administration, dosage form, and strength as the reference product. Additionally, like all FDA-approved products, biosimilar products must comply with good manufacturing practices, demonstrating quality um, of, the, of the drug product. There are some permitted differences between a biosimilar product and the reference product, though these are limited. A biosimilar applicant, and this is similar to what happens on the small molecule side, biosimilar applicants can actually seek licensure for fewer conditions of use that have been approved for the reference product. So for example, if there's a situation where um, there may be patent issues associated with one of the approved indications for a reference product, the biosimilar applicant can actually seek to um, not, not to, can basically seek to not get approval for that particular indication and get approval for all of the other indications for which a reference product may be licensed. Additionally, there can be some differences with respect to delivery devices, container closure systems, as well as some differences in formulations. However, these types of differences cannot result in clinically meaningful differences from the reference product. 
FDA has a, has a very vigorous approach towards evaluation of biosimilarity, and the FDA calls this their totality of the evidence approach. And essentially what this means is that um, the amount of data that a biosimilar applicant will need to provide to FDA may differ on a case-by-case -case basis. But essentially this data consists of uh, data from three buckets. The first being analytical studies that are intended to show that the proposed biosimilar is highly similar to the reference product. The second being animal studies, including tox assessment. And the third being clinical studies, one or more clinical studies, to demonstrate the safety, purity, and potency in at least one condition of use. In in approaching this totality of the evidence standard, FDA encourages biosimilar applicants to take a stepwise approach. And what that means is that at every step, the analytical step, animal studies, clinical studies, uh, a biosimilar applicant is to compare its product to the reference product and evaluate where there may be residual uncertainty in demonstrating biosimilarity and then developing studies that help to mitigate some of that residual uncertainty. And the upshot of this process is that the foundation to a biosimilar, pro a biosimilar development program tends to be extensive structural and functional characterization of the biological, of the biosimilar product compared to the reference product. Um, additionally, FDA has set forth some factors that may justify um, doing additional animal or clinical studies, and some of those factors are set up here on the slide, um, I've gone through some of these, but basically rigorous structural and functional characterizations between the reference product and the biosimilar product, understanding the mechanism of action across different conditions of use, um, clinical knowledge as to the reference product, and availability of any relevant pharmacodynamic measures. FDA remains open to extrapolation. And what this means is that a biosimilar applicant need not demonstrate, I may not necessarily provide clinical data in every single indication for the reference product. Instead, FDA is open to accepting clinical data in one particular indication and letting the applicant extrapolate that across other indications as well. Um, provided that the applicant provides sufficient scientific justification that addresses a number of factors, including mechanism of action, PK, potential immunogenicity across different patient populations, and differences in expected toxicities. I mentioned earlier that there is a subset of biosimilar products known as interchangeables. And this, this subset is defined within the statute. And basically, interchangeable products are products that can be substituted for the reference product without the intervention of the prescriber. So the biological product needs to be biosimilar to the reference product. It can be expected to provide the same clinical result as the reference product in any given patient. And if for multi-use products, products that are administered more than once, switching or alternating between the proposed interchangeable and the reference product should not increase the risk of safety or diminished efficacy compared with using the reference product multiple times. However, there are no FDA-approved interchangeables yet. There remains a lot of interest in the industry with respect to development of interchangeables, and there's been a lot of interest in figuring out what does FDA require to get approval of an interchangeable product? So in response to that, the agency finally issued a draft guidance earlier this year that provides some um, interesting takeaways as to the agency's thinking on demonstration of interchangeability. The guidance is extremely lengthy, and it covers the kind of data and information that a biosimilar applicant needs to provide to FDA to prove up interchangeability. And the overarching theme here is that the data that's going to be needed is going to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. There are a couple of other takeaways from this guidance that I want to um, raise here. One of the interesting things is that FDA said in the guidance that it expects sponsors to submit data and information to support a showing of interchangeability across all licensed conditions of use. So um, this may not necessarily be clinical data across every single condition of use. FDA is still open to extrapolation of data. But I think this indicates that, the, that even if you're um, seeking interchangeability in one indication, FDA understands that 
that product may be used in other indications, and so you need to provide data that supports that product can be used as an interchangeable across all conditions of use. Additionally, the draft guidance provides some input on FDA's thinking with respect to post-marketing data. It's clear from the guidance that post-marketing data alone is not sufficient to prove up interchangeability. Um, instead, in certain situations, post-marketing data may be necessary as supplementary to proving up interchangeability, but will probably be insufficient alone. Um, there's also a, a very vigorous approach to demonstrating interchangeability through the use of switching studies, and FDA has offered up um, some insight into how those switching studies should be designed, and sponsors need to be prepared to demonstrate, um, they need to be prepared to design their switching studies so that there are going to be at least three switches between the reference product and the interchangeable. Um, interchangeables, again, they, they remain of uh, the industry remains pretty interested in interchangeables in part because um, of how state substitution laws are evolving in the biosimilar space. Under many state laws that have been implemented, only interchangeable biosimilars can be automatically substituted for the reference product. And even across some of those <clears throat> state, state laws, there will need to be prescriber notification and certain record keeping requirements as well. This is an evolving area. We're constantly seeing states enact legislation related to biosimilars and interchangeables. Um, so there remains a lot of interest in the uptake of interchangeables and biosimilars. Um, finally, if you're interested in finding out what the status of FDA's um, approved biosimilars and interchangeables are, you can take a look at FDA's Purple Book, which is a list that the agency maintains of all approved biological products. And the, there is a website provided here um, as to where you can go to find the Purple Book. And FDA in this list will indicate which products are biosimilars or interchangeables based on um, the abbreviation B or I. Um, and finally, I just want to touch briefly on um, REMS, and many of you may be familiar with what, what REMS are, but they are basically risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, and they're put into place by FDA and drug sponsors where there is a drug product whose risks may outweigh its benefits. Um, and REMS go above and beyond just standard patient labeling. They may include things like a medication guide or dear healthcare provider letters or elements to, ass uh, to assure safe use. And these things include um, prescriber certification, dispensing drugs only from specially certified pharmacies, documentation of safe use conditions like mon monthly liver testing or monthly pregnancy testing, um, and the maintenance of patient registries by drug sponsors. There are a number of biological products that are subject to REMS with elements to assure safe use, and biosimilar and interchangeable product sponsors will be subject to those same requirements. So if there is a REMS in place for the innovator biologic, you can expect that there will also be a REMS in place for the biosimilar and interchangeable in order to mitigate some of those risks. Um, in contrast to the small molecule space, there is no requirement in the law that biosimilar sponsors and biological reference product sponsors work together to create a single shared REM system for, um, for approved products that have elements to, to assure safe use. This has not become an issue yet because none of the biosimilars that have been approved have elements to, assert, to assure safe use, but I expect that at some point down the line this will become an issue that, that becomes ripe. So watch this space. Okay, I'll pass it over to Dr. Hanauer now.